in these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. What 2020 has shown us is that there's a real need for vigilance, that women's rights are not yet really embedded um, in our maternity system and that they can be easily eroded. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored. My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. The hard truth is there is a lot of racism there. It's not enough to be non-racist, swimming in a pool of racism. You have to be anti-racist, actively working against racism. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session six of series four of Maternity and Midwifery Hour, and welcome to everybody here. Um, my name is Sue MacDonald, and I'm the curator of the Maternity and Midwifery Hour, as well as the Maternity and Midwifery Festival. So it's my pleasure to be chairing this session this evening. And I'm joined this evening by Professor Amy Brown, who is, I know will be known to many midwives and student midwives joining us. So yes, welcome, midwives. Amy. Um, and I always have to start with a moment of the week just to start things off. So, Amy, what is your moment of the week? We've been planning this one for the last five minutes and I'm going to tie it into a special day it is today. So my moment of the week is my accidental um, going on a 20 mile run a few days ago now. And if people don't know, I've been doing a virtual run around the coast of Wales, which is 870 miles, um, raising money for the Human Milk Foundation, which is why it turns um, neatly into today being the World Day of Human Milk Donation. So if you'd like to sponsor me, um, all money <laughs> is going to the Human Milk Foundation. They're currently planting a milk wood full of trees. So go check out their page after this, obviously. Oh, wow. Now, now I just need to reiterate <laughs> that though Amy is talking about a virtual run around Wales, it actually is a real run with real legs yeah. and feet. And if you follow Amy on her Twitter feed, you will see that an accidental run of 20 miles means just that, actual running along 20 miles. But how anyone could do 20 miles accidentally? Well, Amy, you are an inspiration. It did involve an ice cream in the middle and gin when I got home, so don't worry about me too much. <laughs> I haven't become a complete health nut. <laughs> I think that's very understandable. Excellent. Thank you very much, Amy. Well, first of all, we'll just go to the usual sort of things that we need to just go through before we move on to the meat of, of Amy speaking this evening. Um, as many of you will know, these sessions were designed to support midwives and student midwives, people who want to become student midwives, people in maternity services who needed continuing professional development during this time, because obviously with the, with the onset of the pandemic, opportunities for face-to-face -face activities or learning, study days, conferences and the rest were curtailed severely, completely in fact. So we needed to move everything online and we felt that an, an hour a week would just give midwives and student midwives some information and contact with other midwives and other students. So I'm hoping that our audience this evening are people we, we know. A lot, I know a lot of you are old friends, so welcome. And, and just reminding you that all of the, uh, well, the festival materials and all these evenings are taped and recorded and they're kept and you can access them after the date. So if you enjoy this evening, which I know you will, 
definitely and you want to share with your colleagues you can find this on Netflix and you can join your colleagues and watch it all over again more than once if you wish very very useful for those of you who are looking to do your revalidation or if you're doing a project for further studies or if you're a student doing an assignment this is the place to go loads of information loads of really good materials for you so just look at Matflix. So thank you to, to them for looking after everything for us. Now, as you, you'll know, we're moving along the road, Max, slowly, but surely. And there's been things opening up this week, and I, I suppose in particular pubs. Now, Amy's had a gin and tonic. I don't think that was in a pub, but I know many of you will have been able to actually celebrate being able to go out and, and have more um, social activities this week and we're moving towards June where the uh, restrictions will re reduce further but there are still people poorly and we still need to be cautious obviously because it's still around especially with the new variant so look after yourselves and keep safe also big thanks and big love also to all our intensive care units our high dependency care units all the the hospital services that are keeping people cared for and safe and are now revving up to get all these waiting lists reduced it's a, a lot of work to do and they're just rising to it as our good old NHS always does well done fab fabulous I'm always so proud to be have been within the NHS fantastic and a big thank you also to people in the vaccination services now I know a lot of people doing vaccinations are nurses and midwives also. So thank, a big thank you extras for you and to our maternity services who've just carried on throughout, keeping everything good, keeping everything safe for mothers and babies and families. Um, now, I'm just going to move on to this week's news. And the, this week's news, first thing is a big congratulations to Angelina Ancomo diabetes lead midwife at West Hertfordshire Hospitals NHS Trust, who won the um, BAME Award of uh, Midwife of the Year on the 6th of May. Big congratulations to Angelina. Um, I think she was amongst some st strong competition, so it's fantastic to win that. Now, as uh, Amy said, it's World Day of Human Milk Donation today. And th so do go to the... Um, the website as Amy suggests and have a look and see what's happening there um, from 16th to the 22nd it's world respected labor day and I don't know so much about that but I think it's an American um, driven activity and I know we do have some American nurses and midwives here watching so hello to you it's also world preeclampsia day and check out, and this is all on your list of resources if you want to check this out, the Action on Preeclampsia website. It's the really fantastic place to go to get any information, support and training materials. Information for women and families also, really good resources. I'm going to say a big greetings to Sheena Byron. Hi, Sheena. And I'm also going to just uh, remind you about the Association of South Asian Midwives uh, ASAM and Society of African and Caribbean Midwives report from work with black and brown midwives, what we need to thrive. Again, that's on the resource page. And I really would recommend you read that. It's quite an uncomfortable read because it's people reporting what has been said very recently, which is not necessarily a good thing for the, for the people who are experiencing that. So do have a look at that and absorb it and share it with your colleagues. It's also um, today, International Day of Action Against Bullying in Nursing and Midwifery. This is very much led by the Australian and uh, United States midwives and nurses. And I wanted to kind of highlight it because I think it's really important. I know we have our anti-bullying day sometime in November. But I think we always have to keep it on our agenda. It always is a bit shocking to me to think that in nursing and midwifery and then within the health services also there is bullying and sometimes it's people who don't realize they're bullying or think they don't realize and I think we really need to look at the effect on people of bullying both people who are bullied more because they're the victims but also the people who are bullying because often they've come from some problem themselves so I'm going to um 
just share actually a poem that was written by Jenny Clark, the wonderful Jenny Clark, who's known to many, again, many of you as Jenny the Midwife, in honour of that this day. And this, she's, she's written, she has written a po poems before, and this one she wrote specially for tonight and for this day. So it's bull called Bullying. Just trying to change how good care is made. Make a difference, not put others in the shade. Campaigning strongly about your important issues. Finding ourselves bullied, reaching, reaching for tissues. They tell you to think outside the box, failing to protect you from slurs, smears and knocks. Colleagues who you once thought friends, no interest whatsoever in making amends. Mocked for awards that we receive. No sense of the bigger picture leaves others jealous and aggrieved. Some in their nature see achievements as competition. Success isn't defined in a pay rise or promotion. When you make a difference to a woman's experience, future midwives see you as a positive influence. There's more to being bullied than the bullies know. We look back with pride at the compassion we showed. As time goes by, the bullies grow old. It was never their invisible cloaks that were made of gold. That's got a shiver down my neck, actually. And thank you, Jenny. That's beautiful. And thank you for sharing with us. If you want a copy of that, just have a look on Twitter and we'll also put it on the resource page for you. Now, I'm not going to take more time from Amy <laughs> because I promised her a really full part of an hour. Um, this evening, we're going to be looking at the rhetoric, can't even say the word, and reality of motherhood and being a new mum. And this is in the context of really understanding women's experiences and how midwives can provide information support tailored to each mum and her baby. And I'm so pleased, delighted to welcome Professor Amy Brown. She's well known to many of you, to many midwives and students. She's a professor of child public health at the Swansea University. She's got a background in psychology and she spent the last 13 years exploring psychological, cultural and societal influences on infant feeding decisions in the first year. Her research seeks to understand how we shift our perceptions of how babies are fed away from an individual mothering issue to a wider public health problem with societal level solutions. And she's published loads of papers, loads of book, books. And it's an example is Breastfeeding Uncovered there and the positive breastfeeding. Whoop, I'm trying to get it. Post, best breastfeeding book. Um, and she's got a new book out too. I know she's going to share that with you. And I know it's going to be a very precious book. She's also a blogger and a tweeter. And she's also been in 2019 named as the one of the nation's lifesavers by the Made in Uni movement or group. I'm not sure how you'd say it. So a big welcome to Amy and thank you so much for making the time to be with us. The screen is now yours, Amy. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me share this. OK, so what I'm going to talk about this evening is this idea of the difference between how motherhood is often sold to us and how it can really feel for many of us along a continuum, but something we often keep completely hidden from those around us. And what I'm particularly passionate about at the moment is really trying to get some change out there, some conversations going around how we do struggle and how that's got nothing to do with how much we love our baby or how much we actually want to be a mother to that baby, but more the context that we're trying to be mothers in. So if you start Googling uh, image of a new mother, you get image after image that basically looks like this. You have a mother who is smiling, who is usually wearing pale colored clothes, her hair is perfectly done, her nails are done, she's got a lovely baby. The babies are never newborn babies because we know that they seem to be cutest for photos at around this age. And she's often got a doting part partner with her at, at some point. And was sold this image. And I then started Googling motherhood quotes and went down, you know, quite a rabbit hole here. 
But this was one of my favorite ones. So there are hard days in motherhood, but looking at your baby sleeping reminds you why it's all worth it. And I think those of us with older children after a hard day have probably gone into a sleeping child's room and gone, okay, they're lovely whilst they're asleep. But this concept there of new motherhood being about your baby sleeping and you spending all this time sort of gazing at them sleeping in some sort of little happy bubble seemed again to be completely at odds with what women tell me and what women share with each other often in secret because they're too scared to say it more publicly. Although on the same set of quotes, I did really like this one. So Babies are the, wor are the worst roommates. They're unemployed and they don't pay rent. They keep insane hours. Their hygiene is horrible. If you had a roommate that did any of the things babies do, you'd ask them to move out. And um, <laughs> I've got just the, the sentiment behind this. It is said in a comical, jokey way. But actually, when we start thinking about all the stress and strains that new mothers are under and the lack of value and support they often have around that, then this is a really clear point. We might, after a hard day, go for a drink with friends and complain about a relationship or family member or, or partner or whoever. We come home after a long day at work and complain about that. And people understand, they complain with us, they sympathise. Are we allowed to do it in the same way when we've had a really hard day and night with our baby? Are we allowed to say, you know what, I'm utterly fed up, I've had enough of this, I want to run away? Because that's how many of us feel when you start digging under the surface. It can be temporary, we can love our babies very, very much, but it's the other emotions that go alongside it, particularly how challenging it can be, that we don't often talk about. So if you actually go to the literature and start kind of digging around the research, you'll actually find quite a number of papers that go against this idea of the idyllic, happy, glowing, sunshiny motherhood. There's some really interesting work and books written around actually how motherhood can be full of all these different emotions. It can be full of love, it can be full of positive moments, but also it can be full of really dark emotions and really challenging times especially when you're in a context where you're not well supported. So they've done quite a bit of research on how happy parents to be and new parents are. And what's quite interesting is that once you get past the early months of pregnancy and you're getting towards the end of pregnancy, on average, because obviously everyone is different, your kind of life satisfaction and happiness really peaks there. Just before the baby is born, you're really excited and you're usually in that little bubble after birth. But then for women in particular, it actually starts to decline. And that's not because they don't love their baby or they don't want to be a mother or they'd rather none of this had happened. It's often because of all the context that goes alongside that. So they have that love and they have that form of connection to their baby in different ways but they also are experiencing relationship stresses and changes to their life and they're not getting much sleep and their overall satisfaction declines. Their relationship satisfaction also declines in that first year. It declines slightly for both parents, but much at a steeper rate for mothers. It does go back up again as women in particular get kind of used to it and get into the flow and their baby becomes a little bit more dependent and not needing um, the same sort of intensive care all the time and things start to set into a pattern it does start to go back up again but that's usually at around the age that children are going to school and Adrian Rich who was a, a author back in the 70s writes extensively about this and this is one of my favorite quotes which sums it up so my children cause me the most exquisite suffering of which I have any experience. It is the suffering of ambivalence, the murderous alternate alternation between bitter resentment and raw edged nerves and blissful gratification and tenderness. That rocketing between different emotions, those moments when you look at your baby and you genuinely think, this is lovely. It's usually after you've had a bit of sleep and your baby is actually having a nice content day you rarely wake up for the fifth time in the middle of the night and think, wow, I am so blessed. I cannot get enough of this. This is the best, happiest time of my life. But society tells us that that's what we should be thinking. 
and we often go along with it on social media, there's increasing research that shows that across our life, we lie on social media. So either through omission and leaving things out, by bending things, by just showing our best bits, or actually downright lies. So we could have had the most awful day, but we feel that we have to portray an image that says we're having a lovely time. And that's particularly true when it comes to new motherhood. Some very interesting research showing the kind of circular effect where mothers went onto places like Facebook and Instagram, and they saw these wonderful, lovely, happy families, happy photos, you know, partners kind of saying how lucky they are to have this new mother in their life and um, all these just gleeful, lovely experiences. It's always sunny as well. And they've had a dreadful day and they're covered in milk and they've been sat on the sofa and they're sleep deprived and they're crying and they think, well, what's wrong with me? I'm, I need to put a beautiful post up as well. So they post saying, I've had such a lovely day. I'm so blessed. And they get the reinforcement from that. You get everybody liking and saying how wonderful you are and how good a mother you are and how lovely your baby is. And we get stuck in this really sort of strange mix up of emotions when we're not sharing the actual facts and we're not opening up and actually sharing how we might be feeling under all of this. And a couple of years ago now, I actually started talking to parents for, um, I was gonna wave this book at you, which you actually can't see on my little screen. Let's talk about the first year of parenting, the one we forgot to put in, um, about actually how they honestly felt when they had their baby for the first time. And I'd put up a Facebook post and I'd shared it on Instagram and Twitter. And I must have had about 500 responses and personal messages. Just this outpouring of sharing about how people really, really felt. And that the more they read how other people felt, the more they suddenly felt validated and seen and that this was all all right. And it wasn't a sign that there was something wrong with them. And it wasn't a sign that they were a bad mother or that they weren't doing this really well. And it was just this real pattern in the posts where someone would share something and then they'd go, oh, that's actually the first time I've ever told anybody this. I've talked about not falling in love immediately with my baby and it taking weeks, even months to really feel that connection. And I've never written that down. I've never said that out loud. I pretended to everybody that I, as soon as I saw that baby, I fell deeply, deeply in love with them immediately because that's what everybody else was telling me should be happening. And the women who were sharing this with me, they weren't just new mums. They were grandmothers. They were women in their 60s and their 70s suddenly saying, I'm just so glad I came across this post. It's like this really honest version of motherhood. And it's not that I don't love my baby and it's not that I'm not grateful for them. And it's not that I don't want to be a mother. It's just that nobody talks about the mixed picture. Everyone pretends it's this perfect little bubble and perfect images of these happy families. But these were some of the things that parents talked to me for, about. So that concept of not falling in love immediately with your baby, so common often not talked about. I mean, you know, you've just had a baby, you've just gone through birth, you're exhausted, you may be in pain, you may be processing all sorts, to then immediately be expected to have this blissful experience is actually the strange thing. Grieving for your old life, and again, it doesn't mean that you don't love the life that you've got. It's perfectly normal in any other circumstance in life to be able to move on positively, but still have those thoughts about what you've left behind. So you might get a brand new job and really love it. It's the job of your dreams, but you miss your old colleagues and you miss the cafe down the road, you know, and you miss the place that you worked in. And we understand that. Or you move area and you miss the local park, you miss your neighbours, you miss that part of the country, while still really loving where you've moved to. But for some reason, we don't talk about it so much. And life has changed and it's changed for quite a considerable amount of time for most people. The feeling that you've lost your identity, that you've become mum, that you now are spending your day caring for a baby and you don't have much to share other than, well, I fed him and I changed him and I tried to get him to sleep and that didn't work, so I fed him again and then he needed changing again. You haven't got 
those experiences in your day-to-day life that you're used to having, feeling trapped, wanting to run away. So many people said to me, I had these days where I just wanted to get in the car and drive as far away as possible without anybody. I didn't want anybody to touch me, to talk to me. I just wanted to sit in silence. Or other mothers were saying, I felt absolutely trapped because I was desperate to have a break. All I could focus on was I need a break from my baby. But at the same time, the idea of leaving my baby was absolutely petrifying. (laughs) So it was this juxtaposition between desperately wanting something, but really not being able to have it, even if somebody offered it to you. And feeling incompetent that everybody else knows what they're doing. Seeing people walking past your window, looking like they know everything about your baby and looking at your baby and thinking, well, I don't know what's going on. What's wrong with me? And another emotion that we really don't talk about much when it comes to new mothers is the concept of postnatal rage. Now, I'm going to touch a little bit just later on on postnatal depression and postnatal anxiety. And we, we, we understand those emotions. We expect them in some new mothers. But this concept has been really interesting to uh, me for quite a while since I read about it when, when researching for this book is how frequent actually feelings of really strong anger are on becoming a mother. So being angry at everybody around you, being angry at your partner, being angry at the situation, it's a combination of hormones and hormone change and the physical stresses you've been through. But actually, just like a lot of things in this experience, it's a really logical reaction to what you've gone through. So you've gone through this and quite often, obviously not in every family, but quite often you're the one doing the majority of the work. You're the one being sleep deprived. You're the one doing all the emotional work, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's just all these pressures being not seen, being not valued, feeling that you've lost those opportunities around you. No wonder we feel angry. I think society sometimes thinks stereotypically it's just men who get angry. We expect them to go out and get angry about stuff. Might not be a good thing, but we understand that they do it. But actually, the number of women with that rage under the uh, under the surface. And this is just from a blog article that I've got on my website. If you want to go and have another read of some more information about it, it's if you look for Professor Amy you'll find everything on there. But it's something that I think we don't talk about enough and is not expected. So women think, oh, I've got to hide this on top of everything else. And then something else that has been um, out in recent um, weeks and months as well is this concept of actually feeling really ambivalent about motherhood or actually even regretting it. So the concept that you're really struggling with the concept of motherhood. And in the vast majority of cases here, it's nothing to do with your baby. You often love your baby very, very much and you can have positive times with them. But actually what you are feeling, anything from ambivalence to regret is is all the circumstances around this. So what has happened to your life and the impact on it and the context in which you're trying to mother in. So it's very, very much about the concept of regretting or just not enjoying the mothering role in the context in which you're trying to do it. And that itself is a huge product of the society and the culture that many mothers, particularly in countries like the UK, are trying to mother within. We don't have the layers of support and connection, so no wonder we're finding it challenging. And other aspects, such as really specific things. So um, feeling ambivalent or regretful about how many children you've had. So feeling that you haven't had enough or feeling that you've had too many. Um, The sacrifices that you feel that you've had to make. Um, You can regret the partner that you've had them with. You can have that ongoing feeling that you're not cut out for this and you feel that you're just not a good enough parent for your baby and you think, I shouldn't be the one doing this role. And there's been really interesting just research just showing how common this is when you start talking to parents. But it's something we don't say out loud because as soon as you say, I'm really not enjoying the mothering role, someone will go, what, you don't love your baby? And it's like, 
I didn't say that. I said, I'm struggling with the mothering role. I'm struggling with the day-to-day task. I love my baby very, very much, but everything else is overwhelming me and nobody is coming along and supporting and caring for that. And on top of that, I'm feeling dreadful because now you're telling me you think I don't love my baby and are confirming my worst fears that I'm not cut out for this. And there are certain things that can make this really, really tough. So just the whole finding motherhood itself and that mothering role exhausting or just not for you, it's affected by all these different layers around you. So the biggest factor in all of this, I think is actually how lonely and isolated a lot of new mums are. And that's not to say you don't have friends around you, but the way we now care for babies become mothers, have that mothering role, is so much more isolated and lonely compared to how it would have been in decades gone by. And I don't want to romanticise, you know, all of history in the past, but, you know, there's certainly a real lack of connection, a lack of community connection. We know, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, it's been exacerbated by lockdown. But how many new mothers sit in the house on their own all day for, or for most of it with this very small baby? And then we wonder why they're finding it tough. We weren't designed to do this in isolation. We weren't designed to be caring for babies on our own. It was meant to be a, a group effort as such. It can be exacerbated by things, the challenges that have come about from having your baby. So, you know, there's this kind of myth that if you have a baby, it will just fix everything. It will make life brilliant when we know that can be very, very far from the truth. So it's thinking about how relationship difficulties can often increase after having a baby or at least challenges, money difficulties. All of those things make it even more challenging. And again, it's not the baby. It's the role in the context in which you are. It's the way that because we don't value and care and support for our new mothers, everybody's exhausted. You're not having a break. You feel like, you know, you're doing everything yourself and you're feeling completely undervalued in all of this. I mean, logically, is it any wonder that we're now saying, you know, help, I'm having these really, really difficult emotions around this. How on earth could it be something wrong with the mother It's the context which she's trying to do all of this in. And this, if you haven't seen it, is the ongoing issue of the emotional load of motherhood. So this is from the French artist. She had, I think the book is called The Emotional Load. She's a brilliant cartoonist. This was from an article she had in The Guardian, just about this concept of the emotional load of motherhood. And it's a a cartoon where um, someone goes around to her colleague's house and um, their partner is busy trying to feed the baby and cook the dinner and clean this and clean that. And a, a pot of food boils over and the colleague jumps up and goes, oh no, what have you done? And she's like, well, what have I done? It's because I've done everything is the problem, you know? And he says, well, you should have asked for help. And the concept of the emotional load is just all this effort that goes in, particularly to caring for a baby, that is invisible. And that research shows falls really, really heavily, typically on women. So it's the concept that if the baby needs their nappy changed, somebody can come along and change the baby and go, ta-da, I've changed the baby, I've done this big job. And it's like, well, that was just the tiny end bit you know someone had to decide right the baby needs nappies what size do they need which ones are most comfortable for them which shop sells them have we got enough in have we got the wipes have we got the bags whatever all of that stuff is all the thinking and the continued thinking and planning that goes on behind it and this is a lot of what mothers are struggling with when it comes to that mothering role because often it just seems to pass to them some really interesting research just showing the degree of planning that they do in their everyday kind of mothering roles about, you know, thinking about what food does the baby need and can they eat this and can they eat that and what appointments do they need? All of that stuff is that pressing load on them. And that's why people are cracking. And women do feel this more strongly. Um, Men, of course, can feel 
paternal ambivalence. They can have degrees of regret around having a baby, but women in all the research feel it far more strongly. And I don't know of any research that has compared a typical stay at home mum with a stay at home dad, but come back to that in a second. Typically, and I know obviously all families are different, it's the woman who is carrying the load of the first year of parenting. It's her who's had the baby. She's had the physiological experience of birth. She's exhausted from that. She's usually got the physiological intensity of caring for the baby. It's usually her doing the feeding, doing um, the night wakings, or most of them. And again, you know, really stressing all families are different across a population. This is what happens. It's typically her staying at home who has her friendships impacted, who has her social contact impacted, who has her career impacted. It's those connections that you get when you leave the house in the morning to go to work, the people you meet on your commute, even you know the person you buy your coffee from, all those little incidental conversations and interactions and chances to think about something other than being a parent really make a difference to a day. And when that's taken away from women because they're at home, are we really wondering why some women are struggling hugely with this? You also have the layers of societal attitudes and pressures. So we were joking about this the other day with a friend that I really feel, you know, if I was a dad, I would be, you know, there are winning medals in being a father because, you know, working and um, caring for the kids and sorting everything out. And again, I'm joking slightly here, but it's the way that society in general will praise fathers for doing far less around their children. We've all seen, you know, the dad taking his baby out for a walk on the weekend and being praised because he's there doing something for the baby. When in fact, he might be a stay at home father and this is completely condescending to him as well. But there are pressures on women to be that good mother and there are pressures on women to enjoy this and love this and love this new role in a way we don't expect of fathers in the same way. We put different pressures on them. Men feel a lot of pressure to be the breadwinner, to have that role, to be able to support their family. And that's a different thing. But women and the mothering role is something uh, different in that way in terms of these pressures. There's also the impact of doing more. So this very interesting research down the bottom showed that um, when working, uh, when both parents are working, mothers on average still do more childcare and housework, even when hours in the workplace are equal. And um, working mothers do more um, childcare and housework when they've got a stay at home partner compared to the equivalent um, for working fathers. So we're still doing more and more and more. And we're seeing this career impact. So this again is in the background of when women have a career and they've, they've got that um, job and what they want to be following, you see this impact on their wages and you'll see graph after graph like this. So um, the one on um, the, the left is looking at, so women, so you can see as women come up here towards the average age of having a first baby, if they don't have a baby, their income carries on going straight up. If they do have a baby, they have that immediate hit to their income and they never catch up. And of course this is on average. Um, and this is the men who have children versus men who don't. There's very, very little difference. And actually some um, research has shown that employers will actually be slightly more favourable to men who have uh, a baby or a child at home com compared to men who don't because they're seen as more stable, they're seen as more reliable. There was one really interesting psychological experiment where they sent off fake CVs to a job application and they they had um, female names and um, male names, and they gave these fake um, candidates babies or not. And the women with babies were less likely to have an uh, invite for a, a job interview compared to those who didn't, and the reverse was there for men. And it's just this concept of trying to catch up. And it's not all to do with working hours. Someone will always come along and say, well, the reason men um, earn more after having a baby is they do more hours in the office. And 
To a little extent, that's true, but it, research has shown it actually only explains 16% of this disparity. The rest is around just the pressures on, on mothers in general to do more of it, the views of society about working mothers. And if a woman has a career and she is the breadwinner and she's trying to care for this baby, again, where is the outlet to be able to say, I'm really, really struggling here? Why are we expecting um, anyone to be happy when they have the pressures around them? It can also be particularly stronger in older mothers. So there is research that shows if you have a baby later, you're more likely to struggle with postnatal depression and anxiety, but also you're more likely to struggle with the challenges of mothering. But we, there hasn't been a huge amount of research around why, but some of the reasons are around potentially more change to your lifestyle. So if you have a baby at 35 or 40, you've obviously had a lot more adult life to get used to certain things and certain amounts of money. You've had that comparison. And then maybe you're having a baby at a time when some of your friends are starting to get um, more time back for themselves and you're seeing that real comparison. It can be physically harder when you're older, you can feel tireder. And there's also this greater pressure to sort of be a, a good mother who, who knows it all and knows what she's doing because she's a she's a you know in her late 30s, early 40s. We have almost this terrible stereotype of younger mothers that they're not going to know what they're doing. And again, that works both ways, that then we place the pressure, we're judging the younger mothers and we're placing pressure on the older mothers, which are then feeling even more that they can't speak out. There's also a certain increased degree of planning and expectation involved. So you may have decided your whole life that you're going to wait until you're about 40 to have a baby and you're building up to it and you're thinking, right, this is going to be really positive. Nobody's talked to me properly about some of the challenges of this. And it can hit you even more because you were just expecting something completely different and you'd been expecting something different for a long time. That also ties in, there's some very interesting reading around IVF and emotions and guilt, that if you've had IVF, and particularly if it's taken you a long time to have that baby, that you really then struggle with saying, I'm finding this really difficult because you really deliberately did this and you feel that you've been lucky or you've been gifted or you've put so much into this. But again, of course, we can talk about how challenging it is. And really, it just comes back to this. We have a very you know, skewed idea if we're expecting everything about motherhood to be absolutely glowing and wonderful and everybody to be happy all of the time. Women love their babies very much. They value being mothers. They don't want to change it. But also we need more recognition and support around this because we spend a lot of time in psychology trying to differentiate between a clinical mental health issue and a normal logical reaction to circumstance. And if you sum up motherhood, you know, you're not sleeping, you're sleep deprived, you're exhausted, you're lacking the social connections that you used to have. Yes, you may have new ones, but you're still lacking the old ones. You can feel unsupported, you're missing things you enjoyed, you're not having a break, life is repetitive, you're not valued, you're having this judgment and pressure. Is it any wonder that we struggle with that role and that we're having challenges? And just something I was thinking about as I was writing about this this morning, society has a really vested interest in trying to get mothers not to talk about this. Because if mothers start talking about it, they're going to realise just how much value and worth they have. You know, there's all those studies that add up how much having a stay-at-home mother is worth in terms of income. And it's like a six-figure salary if you had to pay out for all those different things. And if we stop doing that, or if we demanded value and, you know, money even in, in response to this, society would completely fall apart. It's based on, you know, the unpaid work of women is sort of propping society up in a number of ways. We know that through caring for our older population and the impact there of all that, that um, free labour as such in that care. So it thrives on mothers questioning their emotions and feeling that they can't speak out for fear of being accused of not loving their baby. When actually you're in an extremely powerful position, we should be talking about this more. 
And of course, we've had this, the impact of lockdown and how different things will be. And some research that I've been doing talking to new parents, you know, it's it's so common and so normal to be feeling regretful about the timing of having your baby. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. Um, it doesn't mean you don't want your baby, that you'd like a different baby, that you'd like them to go away. But actually saying, you know, this has been so tough on me. I haven't had the experiences I thought I would have. I haven't had the support that I needed. I haven't had the services in place. And actually, you know, I have friends and family who have never held my baby. My, I have so many stories of mothers saying, nobody has held my baby apart from a health professional and my partner, and that's it. You know, this has been so different to how we thought it would be. And to be able to say... It has been so tough. We should be able to say that out loud. And just generally, I did laugh at this picture, right? You know, this is your average mother here. This would be this idyllic mother dream, I think, going and sitting on a beach, you know, in the sun, having a great break. But it's just a reminder that we don't put ourselves first enough. We don't take that time to look after ourselves. We don't take that care of ourselves as we care for everybody else we're too busy putting all that care into caring for our baby that we don't think about ourselves too and sometimes we feel very guilty about the concept of taking a break for us but really a you're hugely important and b do it for your baby your baby needs you in one piece if you can't do it for yourself do it because you should be loved and cared for and valued. And it comes into this wider concept that we just don't care for new mothers well in our society. We don't have that rest and value of them after birth. We don't come and look after them and care for them. Instead, we expect them to get back on with it and care for a baby whilst nobody properly cares for them. And where is that care and support and time for them that they so desperately need? Oh. And just a reminder, it's not a failure to ask for help. Um, something that a lot of mothers and parents in general struggle with is asking for help, for saying, you know what, I actually really need you to. So rather than the British, can I do anything to help? Would you do need anything? And us saying, no, no, we're fine. Um, actually, to be able to say, yes, could you please do this? Or to reach out to services around you or support around you. I've got a real interest in the... Um, concept of counter dependence so we've all probably heard of codependence where people are maybe overly reliant on a certain relationship but you also have people and this is very common in in new mothers in particular where you actually don't want to be dependent on anybody else you're scared of it and you think that you don't deserve help and you put, push people away and you know you deserve all the support you can get and know that it is out there through contacting your midwife through contacting the support services around you and just to finish just I've talked very much about this concept of normal logical reactions and the support and opportunity we need just to be able to talk to people around us and say you know what this is really tough I need your help I'm really struggling with this I need you to do something so I can have some sleep or a break but just if you are feeling any of these things, so if you're feeling continually anxious or miserable or low or really very angry a lot of the time, you're having trouble sleeping, you've got eating too much, eating too little, you know, you're feeling hopeless or worthless or not being able to feel anything at all, reach out to your midwife, to your health professional, because there is so much support out there for you. You can get better. You can have a more positive future here. It doesn't have to feel this way, even though it really might. And it's nothing to do with you. It's the, Much of postnatal mental health issues are around the way that we're not caring for and that we're not supporting new mothers and new families. And it's about reaching out for that support that you need. So just to finish, I thought I'd leave you with this, that always remember that you matter too, that you do matter in all of this, that to be ambivalent or fed up or having a really bad day or just desperately wanting a break is such a normal reaction I always think you know think of yourself as a, a child care worker if you, if you went out to a nursery with young babies and did an eight-hour shift 
and came home and said, oh, you know, I'm so tired. I really need a bath and a nice dinner and an early night. Everyone would go, oh, of course you do. What you do is absolutely amazing and so hard I couldn't do it. So why don't we treat mothers in the same way when they're doing a 24 hour shift, seven days a week? Fabulous. (laughs) Fabulous, Amy. Thank you so much. I think that that's a really good point, because as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, it's the thing about working, you know, as a, as a midwife, whatever, you know, you work hard and you go home and that's it. And it's you pointing out that being a mum is not just a job. It's a 24 hour and, and beyond role yeah. with very little kind of uh, remission, as it were. And I think that that's really highlighted some of the difficulties new mums have um, in a very lively way (laughs) thank you i have got uh, in fact there has been a comment from uh claire hi claire who says i can 100 percent 100 percent relate to all that you are saying i've had more than the average number of children i've had amazing support from my husband but if i ever express how hard a day has been i'm always met met with well you chose to have that many children from others, I'm guilty of putting only positive things on social media for this very reason. Thank you, Claire. That's a very honest um, sharing there. Now, the reason I, I must say that I'm looking away is because I, I have two screens and the questions are coming to me on one screen. So I beg your pardon. That I'm looking away from we just, it. We wouldn't say it for anything else, would we? You know, you don't come home after a hard day's work and go, I'm so tired and someone goes well you chose to have a job just don't have one it's all you you know we just don't do it do we it's so strange I wonder if we can change that I mean I I think it's almost that and and again I was thinking as you were talking it's like a symptom of postnatal care itself isn't it because that's and that's one of the things we as midwives get frustrated with that there's a lot of focus on antenatal care there's a huge focus on labor care and then when you come to the postnatal well you know there's there's less staff to provide the care and women are left to get on with it in in the majority of cases but i will reiterate what emma uh, amy said in that if you are having difficulties you need to highlight it because the the support and the staff are there they just need to know but this is us, us, us being very British and very stiff up a lip. lip it. So Amy, thank you for that. I've got another question for, I've got, well, a question rather than a comment from Martina Donaghy. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Martina, who says, how can we address talking to parents about the realities of parenthood when we've minimal antenatal education? I feel midwifery services have scaled down parent education services to focus mainly on labour hypnobirthing and hence labor and hypnobirthing and hence we're not meeting the psychological needs of parents it's no wonder we have such high rates of postnatal depression yeah i mean it, it is something that we need investment in so that you've got the time to do it and no it doesn't have to be in a a scary way it's just a saying that things can be tough and that it's all right to feel that way i think is is the biggest message i mean there's something about kind of having a baby that we just don't talk about the hard stuff for some reason, like we think we're going to put pregnant women off or scare them or something. But I can't think of anything we do in life that we really want to do that's really easy all the time. Mm. So, you know, if if you want to qualify for a degree, studying for a degree is really hard. You know, training to become a midwife is, is really hard. Mm. Running a marathon is really hard. Um, we do hard stuff all the time it's just that everybody knows that that stuff is going to be hard because we talk about it I think using social media in a positive way um, can be a really good way to get some conversations going as well so you know just highlighting that it's really normal to sometimes feel this way and this is where you get the support because I think sometimes it's you can only get so much into people's heads in the antenatal period because Mm. there's so much to think about that as long as they have that they know that it's a possibility and that it's normal and it's all right and where to then go and get the support Mm. and I think I think the focus that you've made Amy with the it's not that you don't love your baby it's that you've got this 24-hour cover 
and this hard pressure and everyone saying how marvelous it is without really it, i think this is really fantastic and i i was sort of thinking again is it because women are frightened if they say it's horrible and i'm i'm finding it really difficult even you know i love my baby etc do they do they maybe fear that they're you know that the social worker's going to come around or something because <laughs> i think i i have to say i think if more women talked about it if it became accepted as a kind of much more normal which i guess amy is what you're you're doing <laughs> single handed here um maybe women wouldn't have to feel anxious about it they could just express it is that it's separating it from the judgment it's got absolutely nothing to do with how good a mother you are mm -hmm. and the fact that you're worrying about this is probably a you know actually indicative that you are a great mother um because you're actually you know if you weren't worried about your baby at all and had wandered off and left them completely um, <laughs> we're not talking about that sort of circumstance we're talking about you know women who really care and who are really worried about all of this and it's yeah. just you know no one is going to come and take your baby away because you're saying you're exhausted mm -hmm. um what they can do is come along and give you some additional support mm -hmm. but also i think sometimes it can just really help to know that you're not alone in this and that it's normal to feel this way. Um, Cause I think there's a lot of anxiety around thinking, well, am I a bad mother? Um, is everybody else absolutely loving this? Mm. Um, and to take that anxiety away for people to be seen and heard and realize that this is logical. Um, it's a result of you not getting the support and the connection that you need and having this huge change to your lifestyle and society not valuing you for it you know it's, <laughs> it's i'm just waiting for i'm waiting for that six figure sum to be paid yeah. to all these mums that's not going to happen i don't think <laughs> anyway lola hi lola is saying do we also need to invest more in postnatal care so often women are cut off from maternity services as soon as they've had a baby which is ironically is when they need us the most yeah i think i know the answer to that one <laughs> yes <laughs> Yes, yes, Lola. Yes. <laughs> Loads. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's that first six to eight weeks for me is the real key period when, when your baby starts, you know, settling a little bit as you kind of get more confident. I think we just really need that intensive support in that first six to eight weeks and it would reap such benefits mm. um, in all sorts of ways. Um, mm. Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay next we've got a, another comment from martina it says hopefully continuity of care teams will or continuity of carer teams will implement postnatal groups which would really help women to share their experiences and gain further ex support i mean yeah. it is very much connecting with other women as well yeah. and it's, it's about having that trusted relationship that you know you're not going to open up to somebody who knew who was just you've just walked into their room mm. it's not the sort of conversation you have with a stranger is it or over lockdown you know one of the biggest things was when so many conversations were moved to telephone conversations mm. you don't start talking about your mental health and your worries over the phone to someone you don't know do you no, it, no. It, you know it's it's that continuity and that relationship and that network and that's why other mothers and support groups can play such a valued role in that because it's that acceptance and that and of me too almost of yeah that's how I felt I think we all have a role to play in it as well I was saying to someone early you know when you have that kind of step away from having a tiny baby yourself and your children are older and you know they're fine um, <laughs> you can kind of start saying a lot more but actually it was really tough I felt like this I felt like that because mm. you're removed from it so we mm. can talk about it with kind of far less risk of judgment because we have that distance and confidence from it so I think it's one of the biggest kind of services you can almost pay a new mother just to talk about you know it's not you it's mm. everything else blame them not yourself okay <laughs> and maybe one of the things is actually focusing on the mum not just the baby you know people do tend to, to visit and say oh lovely baby lovely baby and the, the mum gets kind of almost left out of that discussion yeah. really sometimes normalize going and visiting a new mother yeah <laughs> rather than a new baby the new baby is a nice added extra and you know. take cake and make the tea for yeah. mum 
Gifts for new mothers, not new babies. Yeah. New baby okay. doesn't need anything. <laughs> they don't need, you know, another outfit. <laughs> bring cake, bring gin. <laughs> we'll start we'll start with the cake and tea. Okay, we've got now another comment from Sandy Connolly. Hi Sandy. Uh, we're talking, we were talking about putting ourselves at the top of the list this morning as a parent peer group. I'm facilitating. Well, that sounds interesting. If we're well and supported, we can care for our babies well. Opening yeah. these conversations, signposting support and how to ask for support is so, so important for the benefit of families. That's really helpful, Sandy. Thank you for that. That's, and that's great to have a, a, a parent peer group. So it's happening. But it's, I think the point about the lockdown is it's made some of these things harder. So we're going to have to pull, pull some, some things up a little bit more. OK, and we've got uh, Rebecca Sabin. Hi, Rebecca, who says, fabulous to hear you talk through some of the points from your book. I'm almost a newly qualified practitioner for post practice with NCT, and I can't wait to start the conversations in early days courses. There we are. She's got the book. book. <laughs> I, think, I think it's that very excellent that book. book. <laughs> Available from all good bookshops. <laughs> now, Amy, I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> and then Sandy Connolly says, the dream would be everyone who is pregnant is assigned a postpartum doula. Well, I think the dream is that every woman will get somebody connected and it, that could be a doula it could be the midwife it could be it could be a friend friendship group it's but just important to have support and I think Amy has really highlighted the kind of different ways that people can help but also that the mum herself needs to kind of start thinking about how she can kind of say what she's feeling herself without feeling guilty and judged the term I still love my baby I still love my baby. That goes beautifully. And also, you know, saying what she needs. Again, just going back yeah. to the idea that we must, you know, actually say, um, mm. this is what I would really like you to do, <laughs> please. That's not selfish. That's, you know, it's people like to help. Yeah. No, absolutely. And that could include washing up, doing the shopping, yeah. all, all that <laughs> <Have a> stuff. <laughs> This is how you operate the dishwasher. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, I have to say this hour's gone mm -hmm. like a flash. Amy, I could listen to you forever, actually. Wonderful as always. And Amy will be at a forthcoming festival also. Look with out for new, her books. With, with her new book. With, with all her book. books. And she, she'll sign Brand copies and all sorts. Yeah. Lovely. <laughs> thank you so much. I would just like to say a big thank you to Amy because you've opened up quite, quite actually quite a difficult area for us to think about and for us as midwives to think about helping women to express some of these things and, and kind of be honest and be able to get the help they need and the support they need. So it's really, really important. So thank you very much, Amy, for, for being with us this evening. Um, do join us next week and we've, we've got another interesting week next week we're going to be talking about the menopause so we've gone from having a baby immediately to now looking at the menopause and we have and um, deborah holloway nurse consultant from guys hospital who will be joining us there so with that i'd like to say a big thank you for joining us we've given you lots to think about i know amy has you and lots to think about books and things Show, show oh, the book, book, Amy. Last book. Very excellent book. book. <laughs> this is like being on a chat show. <laughs> and just as a final, just to our audience, just take care of yourselves and stay well. And we'll see you next week. In these challenging times, everybody needs a green shoot and a pearl of wisdom. What 2020 has shown us is that there's a real need for vigilance, that women's rights are not yet really embedded um, in our maternity system and that they can be easily eroded. And I think there is a real risk that services that are lost or reduced during the time of COVID are not restored.
My argument is that the solution is health optimization. Prevention is far better than cure. The hard truth is there is a lot of racism there. It's not enough to be non-racist, swimming in a pool of racism. You have to be anti-racist, actively working against racism.